Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, everyone. And uh, we're off to a great start here with the Constitution Day. You know, the uh, uh, framers had in mind that this would be a living document. Um, and sure enough, from uh, uh, 1789 all the way up to today, uh, think of how the country has changed and of uh, the various uh, evolutions and uh, uh, processes that the country has undergone. Yet the Constitution remains as relevant today as it did back in 1789. Uh, we have a uh, great flexibility in this document. Over years, uh, certain practices, informal as well as formal, have evolved uh, to breathe life into the Constitution. And uh, it's very relevant today. Now, uh, the Congress has asked that uh, every September, I know you'll remember in September of 1789 is when the Constitution was ratified. Every September that there'll be some event on college campuses to commemorate that great uh, happening and a great uh, historic event for uh, American history. So uh, we have put together a great deal of uh, uh, variation, if you will, uh, for this event. Uh, you're going to hear from people, not just a reading of the Constitution, although that's the way I'll start out with the, with the preamble, but the fact that it's a living document is very, is crucial. And it's something that you all should be very um, familiar with. When you hear someone say, I have a right to do this, or you don't have a right to do that, it all stems from the Constitution. And you should know it's not a, it's not a, a red document or a blue document, it's not Republican, it's not Democrat, it's an American document. And the parties have evolved uh, within that framework and against the uh, social and uh, the economic and political uh, development of the country have all evolved within that framework uh, of this document. It is absolutely crucial that you understand it. You know, today, for example, in this day and age, there's a great deal of talk about the war in Iraq, and was it legal or was it not legal? Well, there are very uh, uh, strong statements in the Constitution, very clear statements about who has the right to declare war and what the presidential uh, uh, prerogatives are and what the articles are for Congress as well. Uh, so the, uh, for the executive branch, the legislative branch, the judicial branch, all spelled out very clearly. Well, let me start, if you will, and I wanted to re, uh, before I begin, to re-emphasize the importance of that Teaching American History grant that Eric spoke about. I hope that you'll be checking Access BCC and our uh, teleprompters and uh, all of the calendars and schedules in the publications uh, for the various events that have taken place. Now, as it happens, my own, uh, graduate training, I got my PhD in history, so I have a love uh, for history, and I have participated on occasion with the Teaching of American History uh, workshops, and, the, and it's a wonderful area of, of interest uh, for uh, professionals in the field. Uh, K through 12 teachers and our own college professors come together and discuss the love that they have for history. It was one of the most rewarding teaching experiences that I've ever had over 34 years of teaching. Uh, and I commend to you the people, the, the great uh, historians that Eric is able to bring in with, through this grant. And I hope that you'll have a chance to participate in the uh, various activities. And it covers the gamut of American history from the earlier, uh, earliest colonial times up to the present day. Well, why don't we start off the uh, uh, program today with my reading of the uh, preamble of the Constitution. Everybody memorize that in uh, school? So the preamble. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity, to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. That's the Constitution, very short and sweet. Six separate items all spelled out the purpose of the Constitution, 
And I think uh, perhaps the most important uh, words in the preamble, this short preamble, are we the people. It wasn't a royal body of the king or uh, any other special groups or uh, the head of uh, Microsoft or anything like that. Uh, it was we the people. And uh, that's, the, that's the important part to remember about the Constitution developed by the people. I'm going to turn over now. I hope uh, maybe we'll have a test about the preamble. Everybody, uh, uh, everybody memorize the preamble in the six parts. I can't tell you how many times I was in public school and uh, had to uh, answer a question about the six parts and the preamble. But those days are gone, I think. <laughs> Let me, <laughs> unfortunately. Let me introduce now back, back to you uh, the uh, head of our Teaching American History grant, Eric Bowman. Eric. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to now uh, introduce Professor Nancy Wood uh, for a reading on uh, resistance. Good morning and happy Constitution Day. The authors of the Constitution endowed Congress with the power to declare war. Once war is declared by the Constitution, by the Congress, Article 2, Section 2 authorizes the President as the Commander-in-Chief to execute the war. But the Constitution does not authorize the President to declare war by himself or herself. James Madison wrote in 1793 about the fundamental doctrine of the Constitution that the power to declare war is fully and exclusively vested in the legislature. At the Constitutional Convention, George Mason of Virginia stated that the president is not safely to be entrusted with the power to decide on war. The framers clearly did not want just one man to put the country at war. Now, I'd like to explain something because I think a lot of civic lessons uh, go unheeded or perhaps even untaught that the Congress of the United States represents whom? People. The people. Who are the people? You and I are the people. We elect these people to represent us, and they are supposed to represent our interests. May the president start a war without a declaration of war. In old Europe, kings were constantly taking their countries into war, and the authors of the Constitution wanted to avoid this. By requiring Congress, not the president, to initiate war, the authors wanted to assure broad support for any war, meaning public support, and since Congress more widely represents the people than does the president. I have a long document here that I could read. This was written by Fred Fulbury, who is senior editor of a publication called The Progress Report. I urge you to look this up on the internet and to come to understand that the current war in Iraq and the current war in Afghanistan are against, they are illegal according to our Constitution. Congress does not have the right to simply hand over to the president the decision-making power to go to war. Congress has to declare war. And for the last 50 years, Congress has reneged on its responsibilities. When we think about war criminals, we might begin thinking about members of Congress who reneged on their grave responsibility. Taking a country to war is the most serious thing that a politician in a Congress can do. Just before the war on Iraq and the occupation of that country, and now nearly 4,000 US lives having been lost, nearly a million lives having been lost of Iraqis, and four million people being in exile and displaced from their homes in that country, a document came forth over the internet called Pledge of Resistance. I have this in English, Spanish, and Portuguese on the same sheet. 
And I'm going to ask uh, people to please distribute that to others in the uh, auditorium as I read the Pledge of Resistance. This pledge is called, Not in Our Name. We believe that as people living in the United States, it is our responsibility to resist the injustices done by our government in our names. Not in our name will you wage endless war. There can be no more deaths, no more transfusions of blood for oil. Not in our name will you invade countries, bomb civilians, kill more children, letting history take its course over the graves of the nameless. Not in our name will you erode the very freedoms you have claimed to fight for. Not in our hands will we supply weapons and funding for the annihilation of families on foreign soil. Not by our mouths will we let fear silence us. Not by our hearts will we allow whole peoples or countries to be deemed evil. Not by our will and not in our name. We pledge resistance. We pledge alliance with those who have come under attack for voicing opposition to the war, or for their religion, or their ethnicity. We pledge to make common cause with the people of the world to bring about justice, freedom, and peace. Another world is possible, and we people, we the people, will make it real. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wood. I'd like, now, uh, I'd like to now welcome to the stage uh, Professor Jim Pelletier for a reading uh, from Bertolt Brecht's The Life of Galileo. Good morning. I'm very pleased to be here. I would like you to know that uh, simply because uh, we chemists are in a field that may be in the minds of some not associated with uh, history, uh, we are. Um, and uh, I have Bertolt Brecht's play Galileo that we focus on in uh, history and philosophy of science. The Constitution affords us the freedom to disagree. And uh, this is not a new idea, by the way. And we can go back to the 1600s CE and uh, see Galileo. That's exactly the problem, that he was not afforded uh, the, the freedom to disagree. The bureaucrats at the time, not associated necessarily with civil government, required that a certain body of information be accepted and be taught with no freedom to disagree. Galileo got into a great deal of difficulty with the authorities as a result. He thought that he should share with his students what he saw in actuality with his primitive telescope. In that case, it was the four moons of Jupiter. They weren't supposed to move. They were supposed to be rigid. Aristotle said that the, they were about this geocentric Earth, eight crystal spheres to which were attached the moon, the stars, and the planets. And all of a sudden it dawned on Galileo and his students, by the way, when they one evening saw four moons of Jupiter with this new improved telescope that they had, uh, funk that they had built. And then on the two days later, they looked again and there were only three moons. And his students said, Galileo, this is frightening. What will they do to us for saying that there is motion in the heavens when the authorities have said that there may not be, there cannot be. Why not? Because we say so. There is no freedom to disagree. 
as we sit here today, chemists and others, we are blessed by having a document the, Constitu the Constitution of these United States that says we do have the freedom to disagree. Professor Wood may stand at this lectern and disagree, as may I if I choose to. That's a freedom we are assured under our founding documents. You should jealously guard that freedom. When you do not participate, when you acquiesce, when you do not exercise your franchise in whatever conscience you happen to be, you are diluting the effectiveness of the Constitution. You should participate. You should participate intelligently in a well-informed manner. Otherwise, Galileo's prediction will come true. When Andrea, one of his students, came to him after Galileo had been unfortunately placed under house arrest for his disagreement, Andrea, one of his students, came back to him and attempting to placate Galileo and say, Master, I now realize the error of my ways. Galileo said, no, Andrea. Because Andrea said to Galileo, Monsignor, my lord, to Galileo out of respect for his professor, he said, unhappy is the land that breeds no hero. And Andrea and Galileo in his wisdom, even then, this is now 1630 CE, said no, Andrea. Sad is the country that needs a hero. Without your participation in your franchise, as a franchise member of the electorate, exercising your rights of the, this magnificent document that our founding fathers bequeathed to us, the Constitution of the United States of America. Without your franchise, without your intelligent exercise of franchise, then I suspect that Galileo's prediction will come true. No, Andrea, sad is the country that needs a hero. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pelletier. Uh, I'd like to now welcome to the stage uh, Professor Dave Williams for a reading by uh, FDR, the big guy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Morning. What I'm going to read to you is basically known as Roosevelt's Four Freedom Speech. It was in his State of the Union address in January of 1941. Um, just a brief background. By January of 1941, the world was not a very good place to be. Hitler controlled much of Europe. War was raging in the Pacific. And this was Roosevelt's answer to that, to a country that was on the edge of, of a major war. Let us say to the democracies, we Americans are vitally concerned in your defense of freedom. We are putting forth our energies, our resources, and our organizational powers to give you the strength to regain and maintain a free world. We shall send you in ever-increasing numbers ships, planes, tanks, guns. This is our purpose and our pledge. The nation takes great satisfaction and much strength from the things which have been done to make its people conscious of their individual stake in the preservation of dem democratic life in America. Those things have toughened the fiber of our people, have renewed their faith and strengthened their devotion to the institutions we make ready to protect. Certainly this is no time for any of us to stop thinking about the social and economic problems which are the root cause of the social revolution which is today a supreme factor in the world. For there is nothing mysterious about the foundations of a healthy and strong democracy. 
The basic things expected by our people of their political and economic systems are simple. They are equality of opportunity for youth and for others, jobs for those who can work, security for those who need it, the ending of special privilege for the few, the preservation of civil liberties for all, the enjoyment of the fruits of scientific progress in a wider and constantly rising standard of living. These are the simple, the basic things that must never be lost sight of in the turmoil and unbelievable complexity of our modern world. The inner and abiding strength of our economic and political systems is dependent upon the degree to which they fulfill these expectations. In the future days which we seek to make secure, we look forward to a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understanding which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear, which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. That is no vision of a distant millennium. It, it is the definite basis for a kind of world attainable in our own time and generation. That kind of world is the very antithesis of the so-called new order of tyranny which the dictators seek to create with the crash of a bomb. To that new order we oppose the greater conception, the moral order. A good society is able to face schemes of world domination and foreign revolution alike without fear. Since the beginning of our American history, we have engaged in change, in perpetual and peaceful revolution, a revolution which goes on steadily, quietly, adjusting itself to changing conditions. Without the concentration camp or the quick lime in the ditch, the world order which we seek is the cooperation of free countries working together in a friendly, civilized society. This nation has placed its destiny in the hands and heads and hearts of its millions of free men and women, and its faith in freedom under the guidance of God. Freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. Our support goes to those who struggle to gain those rights to, or to keep them. Our strength is our unity of purpose. To that high concept, there can be no end except victory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to now introduce, uh, thank you, Professor Williams, um, appreciate that. Um, I'd like to now introduce Professor Barry McKee from Criminal Justice to read uh, something that you guys might need to know. And then again, you might not. Uh, just a little to begin with, uh, why are we here today? The Congress, by joint resolution February 29, 1952, designated September 17th Citizenship Day. And by joint resolution of August 2, 1956, Congress requested that the President proclaim the week beginning September 17th and ending September 23rd of each year as Constitution Week. Some of the basic data. They say the Constitution was written by old white guys. Were they white? Yes, every one of them. Were they guys? Yes, they were all men. So when you hear somebody say, we the people of the United States, stop and think about what that we really meant. Were they talking about anybody but landed white men? Old. The oldest person to sign the Constitution was 81 years old, Benjamin Franklin. The youngest was 26 years old, Jonathan Dayton of New Jersey. The average age of delegates who attended the Constitutional Convention was 44 years old. Old to some of you, young to some of us. How many constitutions have we had? Two. If you include the Articles of the Federation, which was our first constitution. How many amendments have been proposed over the years? 9,000. 9,000 requested changes. How many got through? How many amendments do we have? 
close. <laughs> 27. 27. 19th was important, though. <laughs> How many have been repealed? One. Prohibition. I guess we like to drink. The cost to actually write, and that is to put words on a piece of paper, was $30. It was a fee paid to Jacob Shellis, who penned by hand the Constitution, 4,543 words at about a half a penny per word. Think about that when you're writing papers. Population of the United States, when the Constitution was signed, about 4 million. How many today? As of September 8th, it was approximately 303 million. But we increase approximately one person every 10 seconds. The most important amendment to the Constitution, you could debate this for years, I believe it's the 14th Amendment. It gave weight and clarity to equality. Almost. It still omitted women. Most important of the Bill of Rights, I believe, is the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of people to peacefully, or peaceably, excuse me, assemble and to petition government for redress of grievance. Can you sue the government? Yes. You need one permission. The government's. If they say no, you can't sue. Amazing how many lawsuits don't happen. The Bill of Rights of the Constitution was ratified December 15, 1791. Some quotes, mostly from Supreme Court decisions, about the First Amendment. Censorship reflects a society's lack of confidence in itself. It is a hallmark of an authoritarian regime. Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart, 1966. Every purpose of a Bill of Rights, the very purpose of the Bill of Rights, was to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes of politi political controversy to place them beyond the reach of majorities and officials and to establish them as legal principles to be applied by the courts. One's right to life, liberty, and property, to free speech, a free press, freedom of worship and assembly, and other fundamental rights may not be submitted to vote. They depend on the outcome of no elections. Justice Robert Jackson. 1943. The First Amendment, freedoms, are most in danger when the government seeks to control thought or to justify its laws for that impermissible end. The right to think is the beginning of freedom, and speech must be protected from government because speech is the beginning of thought. Justice Anthony Kennedy. Almost all human beings have an infinite capacity for taking things for granted. All the Huxley, brave new world. Men feared witches and burnt women. It is the function of speech to free men from the bondage of irrational fears. The great, in my opinion, Justice Louis Brandeis, 1927. Some thoughts. When political debate degenerates into name-calling and personal attack, you can be sure the attacker has run out of salient argument. When a group shouts down the speech of another, the attacking group, you can be sure, is afraid of what the speaker has to say. They have also denied him or her their First Amendment right to free speech. If we want to enjoy free speech, we must be ever vigilant to protect that right for our opponents. If it's worth having, it's worth protecting. All rights are accompanied by an equally important responsibility. Keep in mind that mines and parachutes both work best when they're open. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor McKee. Uh, I'd like to now introduce uh, Professor Raymond Pouchot, who will be reading uh, something of his own design, I believe. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light. Viva la raza. Viva Estados Unidos. Viva la raza. Viva Estados Unidos. Viva la raza. Viva Estados Unidos. Hola, estudiantes. Mi amigos, mi amigas. Hello, my name is Raymond Show. It's an honor to have an opportunity to speak with you today concerning a very important historical moment in your lives, the celebration of Constitution Day. I'd like to thank Dr. Sprague for helping situate this, and our director and moderator, Eric Bowman, for all of his hard work in making this day become an event. As you are listening to many presentations, many historical claims, many readings that have significant contributions to our country. I want you to recognize why you're here. Not for lunch, but rather to celebrate being an American. For you, you have been born. You have been privileged. For many of my Latino brothers and sisters, through the issue of immigration, we've had to earn that right. Many of your great, great grandparents have already earned that right. We are a culture of immigrants. And in that fact, we need to take pride because the work, the effort to become a real American in every sense of the word does not come easy. To illustrate this point, I'd like to share a story with you concerning a young woman by the name of Maria Soria. Maria was not from the United States. She was from Chihuahua, Mexico. And Maria worked very diligently to become a citizen of the United States, much like your great great grandparents have done, or grandparents, or perhaps even parents. Maria had to sacrifice. Maria had to suffer. Maria had to work to become an American. To illustrate this factor, I ask you how many of you are parents in this room? Please raise your hand. How many of you are single parents in this room? Raise your hand. Imagine if you would, that you had to go back in time, 40 years ago. You don't even understand the language. Señor Español, está muy bien. You speak Spanish very well, but that is the only language you speak. That was Maria's situation 40 years ago, when she first came to the United States. She raised five children by herself in a small little home in San Antonio, Texas. And they all had to work as a familia to make a living. Oh, don't get me wrong. The children complained about the nature of the work. Carpentry, yard work, working in restaurants. And if you've ever been to Texas, Texas has two types of temperature, hot and hot. In Texas, the heat is tremendous. In Texas, immigration policies are strictly enforced. In Texas, raising a familia by yourself 40 years ago was extremely challenging. And her children, and Benitos, would come to her consistently and say, Ay, mama, está muy caliente, está caliente. Ay, mi hijo, you don't like it? Get an education. The girls would come to her after many hours working in the restaurant and working in the home and say, I am mama. The work is very hard. And she would tell them, I started moving the ending yet. They gave education. All of you are here for a purpose. Today, to celebrate Constitution Day. But more importantly, to get an education. So while you're hearing presentations, people reading quotes of historical value, there is meaning to the words that would make us special. Maria's family was very special. Maria, after 40 years of consistent work, finally, and after three tries, passed her immigration test. 
She raised those five children to the extent that every last one of them have degrees. Two of them are graduates of the University of Texas at Austin. Three others, University of Texas at San Antonio. Two attorneys, two accountants, two pharmacists. She worked very hard to ensure that her children obtained the quality of life that we all dream about as Americans, that you have been privileged to obtain. And I ask you, are you making the most of it? That's a question that only you can ask for yourself. In our country, if you fail, more than likely, you're the one that's accountable for that failure. Maria taught those lessons to her children. Unfortunately, Maria is along with us. Three weeks upon her passing of her citizenship test, she died of a continual kidney disease. But in San Antonio, in the regional part of the north side of the city, she is remembered as a hero, a heroine. And the challenge exists for you to put your foot forward, to work as diligently, to focus on achieving your goals and your dreams so that your children can benefit much in the same framework that your parents work for you. This is not just another day. This is an opportunity to celebrate being an American, to be part of the Stylish Unidos. And while it's true, it doesn't have a flash of a Halloween, or a Christmas, or even an Easter. And while it is very true that you should not be seeing goggles and ghouls walking all over the campus, you shouldn't see a man in a great big red suit with a long white beard outside of Jeremy Dean. You shouldn't see, from that perspective, coming into context, the Easter Bunny on the campus. And if you do see any of these figures today, you have other issues, all right? The point being here is that this is an opportunity for you to celebrate Caucasians, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos. I urge you, while our country has problems and we have issues, whether you agree with the perspective of the war in Iraq, whether you reflect on the perspective of West Virginia, and if you focus on the atrocity and tragedy of 9-11, it's because we are Americans and because of this type of day, this foundation, the writing of the Constitution, that it gives us an opportunity to achieve. And I urge you, and I challenge you, to do exactly that. Whatever limitations you think you have in front of you, remember that you are part of a country which historically is the greatest civilization in the history of the United States. Do not fail yourself. Take pride in who you are. Always remember that. Where you came from and who you are are your persona. Está muy bien. Viva la raza. Viva Estados Unidos. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. Thank you, Professor Pusha. Uh, I'd like to now introduce uh, Professor Zachary Martin, who will be reading something I think you may have had to memorize back in fourth or fifth grade, maybe sixth grade. Um, regardless, it's really good. It's short. Gettysburg Address. It is very short. I will. All right, let's do this. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here 
have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never be forgot what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you. Uh, please welcome uh, Nina Pitts, who will be reading uh, something written in a jail cell about 50 or 60 years ago on the margins of a newspaper. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. I have the honor of reading Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham Jail in Alabama. It's written April 16, 1963, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do because it goes to speak about equality and justice, which means a whole lot to me. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and actions of bad people, but for the appalling silence of good people. We must come to see that human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and persistent work of men willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of forces of social stagnation. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The urge of freedom will eventually come. This is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom. Something without has reminded him that he can gain it. But I continue to think of the matter. I gradually gained a bit of satisfaction from being considered an extremist. Was not Jesus an extremist in love? Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters, righteousness like a mighty stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the gospel of Jesus Christ? I bear in my body the marks of Lord Jesus Christ. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand, I can do none other, so help me God. Was not John Bunyan an extremist? I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a butchery of my conscience. Was not Abraham Lincoln an extremist? This nation cannot survive half slave and half free. Was not Thomas Jefferson an extremist? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether we are extremists, but what kind of extremist we shall be. Will we be extremists for hate, or will, shall we be extremists for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice, or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Nina. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, another student and a member of the BCC Forensics and Debate Team, uh, uh, Joe Foley, who uh, you might know this speech. It's a really good one. It's by Patrick Henry. Today I'll be reading Patrick Henry's Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech. If we wish to be free, if we, mean, if we mean to preserve inviolate those inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending, if 
we mean not basically to abandon the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged, in which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained, we must fight. I repeat it, sir. We must fight. An appeal to arms and to the, to the God of hosts is all that is left us. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be next week or next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution in an action? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemies shall have bound us hand and foot? Sir, we are not weak. If we make proper use of the means which the God of nature hath placed in our power, three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vision, the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable. Let it come. I repeat, sir, let it come. It is in vain, sir, to accentuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has actually begun. The next scale that sweeps north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand here, we idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Thank you, Joe. Um, next, I'd like to welcome uh, another BC student and member of the BCC Forensics and Debate Team, uh, Ms. Kelly Malone, who will be reading some selected poems. Hi, everybody. Um, my first poem is going to be Walt Whitman's poem, For You, O Democracy. Come, I will make the content indissoluble. I will make the most splendid race the sun ever shone upon. I will make divine magnetic lands with the love of comrades, with the life, long love of comrades. I owe plant companionship thick as trees along all rivers of America and along the shores of the Great Lakes and all over the prairies. I will make inseparable cities with their arms about each other's necks by the love of comrades, by the manly love of comrades. For you, these from me, O democracy, to serve you, not for me, for you, for you, I am thrilling these songs. Next, I'm going to be doing Langston Hughes' poems, Let America Be America Again. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. Let America be the dream that dreamers dreamed. Let it be the great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme, let any man be crushed by one above. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'd like to welcome to the stage Stu Rothman, another BCC student and member of the Forensics and Debate Team. Persecution for the expression of opinion seems to me perfectly logical. If you have no doubt of your premises or your power and want a certain result with all your heart, you naturally express your wishes in law and sweep away all opposition. 
To allow opposition by speech seems to indicate that you think the speech impotent, as when a man says he has squared the circle, or that you do not care wholeheartedly for the result, or that you doubt either your power or your premises. But when men have realized that time has upset many fighting faiths, they may come to believe even more than they believe the very foundations of their own conduct, that the ultimate good desired is better reached by free trade and ideas, that the best test of the truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market, and that the truth is the only ground upon which their wishes safely can be carried out. That, at any rate, is the theory of our very own constitution. It is an experiment, as all life is an experiment. Every year, if not every day, we experiment, I'm sorry, every day we have to wage our salvation upon some prophecy based upon imperfect knowledge. While that experiment is part of our system, I think that we should be eternally vigilant against attempts to check the expression of opinions that we loathe and believe to be fraught with death, unless so Im imminently threatened immediate interference with the lawful and pressing purposes of the law that an immediate check is required to save the country. I just want to say in closing that our country was found upon ideas, and ideas is the only thing our country can go forth on. And if everyone has an idea, and if, everyone's make sure, if everyone makes sure their idea is heard, then I think we can all do good for our country. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, another student, uh, Mr. Scott Medeiros, who will be reading Barbara Jordan's address to the 1976 Democratic Convention. Um, this is an historical speech that you may not have heard of, but um, has some credence today, as do all of these speeches. So, uh, please welcome Scott Medeiros. Hello, everyone. A nation is formed by the willingness of each of us to share in the responsibility for upholding the common good. A government is invigorated when each of us is willing to participate in shaping the future of the nation. We must define the common good and begin again to shape a common future. Let each person do his or her part. If one citizen is unwilling to participate, all of us are going to suffer. The American idea, though it is shared by all of us, is realized in each one of us. Let there be no illusions about the difficulty of forming this kind of national community. It's tough, difficult, not easy. But a spirit of harmony will survive in America only if each of us remembers that we share a common destiny. If each of us remembers when self-interest and bitterness seem to prevail, remember that we share a common destiny. I have confidence that we can form this kind of national community. I have that confidence. We cannot improve upon this system of government handed down to us by the founders of the Republic. There is no way to improve upon that. But what we can do is find new ways to implement this system and realize our destiny. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, one more BCC student to the stage, uh, Ms. Katie Rogers, who will be reading um, John F. Kennedy's inaugural address. Thank you. Good afternoon. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending its freedom in its maximum hour of need. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, and the devotion, devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light this country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Finally, whether you're citizens of America or citizens of the world, 
ask us the same high standards which we ask of you. With a good conscience, our only sure reward, with the history, our final judge. Let us go forth and leave the land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, I'd like to welcome Margot Green. Are you here? Bueller. Bueller. Margot Green? Okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, a professor from BCC, Mr. Greg Maravellis. We'll be reading um, something on the women's right to vote, written uh, many years ago by Susan B. Anthony. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. In 1873, Susan Brownell Anthony was arrested and tried for voting. They could not keep her in jail, so they fined her, and she did not pay, and she did not go to jail. Women didn't get the right to vote immediately, but. Here's what Susan Brownell Anthony said in response to the charges. The spirit and letter of the declarations of the framers of this government were based on the, on the immutable principle of equal rights to all. It was we, the people, not we, the white male citizens, nor we, the male citizens, but we, the whole people, who formed this union. We formed it not to give the blessings of liberty, but to secure them not to the half of ourselves and the half of our posterity, but to the whole people, women as well as men. It is downright mockery to talk to women of their enjoyment of the blessings of liberty while they're denied the only means of securing them provided by this democratic Republican government, namely the ballot. Since the beginning of our American history, we have been engaged in change, in a perpetual, peaceful revolution, a revolution which goes on steadily, quietly, adjusting itself to changing conditions without the concentration camp. The world order which we seek is the cooperation of free countries working together in a friendly, civilized society. The nation has placed its destiny in the hands, heads, and hearts of its millions of free men and women and its faith in freedom. Freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. Our support goes to those who struggle to gain those rights and keep them. Our strength is in our unity of purpose. To that high concept, there can be no end Accept victory. Shot pithy quotes about the nature of freedom and liberty. And in this period in our history, when we are at war, when all governments, even those in a democratic society, seek to restrict freedoms because of military necessity, as they say, uh, some of these quotes, I think uh, you would agree, speak to our present condition. Liberty is the possibility of doubting, of making a mistake, of searching and experimenting, of saying no to any authority, literary, artistic, philosophical, religious, social, and even political. That is from Ignazio Silone, Italian radical, of the early 20th century. Nothing is more difficult and therefore more precious than to be able to decide, Napoleon Bonaparte. Here is my advice as we begin the century that will lead to 2081. First, guard the freedom of ideas at all costs. Be alert that dictators have always played 
on the natural human tendency to blame others and to oversimplify. And don't regard yourself as a guardian of freedom unless you respect and preserve the rights of people you disagree with to a free, public, unhampered expression. That is from Gerard K. O'Neill, nuclear physicist and space scientist. Those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves. Abraham Lincoln. My definition of a free society is a society where it is safe to be unpopular. American political candidate in the 1950s, Adlai Stevenson. It is easy to take liberty for granted when you have never had it taken from you, Vice President Dick Cheney. Those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigue of supporting it. Pamphleteer and revolutionary in the American Revolution, Thomas Paine. Liberty has never come from the government. Liberty has always come from the subjects of it. The history of liberty is a history of resistance. Woodrow Wilson. They that can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Benjamin Franklin. This next one is probably my all-time favorite. I believe there are more instances of the abridgment of the freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. James Madison, American Revolutionary and President of the United States. We cannot defend freedom abroad by deserting it at home. Columnist Edward R. Murrow, the contest for ages has been to rescue liberty from the grasp of executive power. Daniel Webster, men fight for liberty and win it with hard knocks. Their children, brought up easy, let it slip away again, poor fools and their grandchildren are once more slaves. Writer D.H. Lawrence. And the last, freedom is never free, anonymous. Thank you, Professor Pereira. I'd like to welcome to the stage um, for a reading um, by Margaret Chase Smith's um, Declaration of Conscience. Uh, please welcome Professor Mary Zahm. Hello. I was happy to join in today, and I didn't know what to choose to read. I got some guidance from Eric because I wanted something by a woman besides Susan B. Anthony. And um, I did, I have something by Margaret Chase Smith, who was a very prominent senator in Maine. I hate to admit it, during my lifetime. And this little talk is a longer article, but I'm going to only read a short portion of it. Um, I remember, I don't remember her talking because I was kind of little, but I do remember the background when um, you might have heard of the McCarthy era where people were being rounded up and brought before the Senate and accused of being a communist or a fascist and their whole career was ruined and even today you might see where a director or filmmaker or artist was banned from working because of the McCarthy era. So this is like in my lifetime, even though it's ancient history for you. And so Margaret Chase Smith stood up in the Senate to protest this uh, McCarthyism. And I'm only going to read a short portion of what she said. She was so highly respected that everybody listened on both sides of the aisle. She said, I think it is high time that we remembered that we have sworn to uphold and defend the Constitution. I think that it is high time that we remembered that the Constitution, as amended, speaks not only of the freedom of speech, 
but also, also of trial by jury instead of by trial by accusation. Whether it be a criminal prosecution in court or a character prosecution in the Senate, there is little practical distinction when the life of a person has been ruined. Those of us who shout the loudest about Americanism in making character assassinations are all too frequently those who, by our own words and acts, and ignore some of the basic principles of Americanism. The right to criticize, the right to hold unpopular beliefs, the right to protest, the right of independent thought. The exercise of these rights should not cost one single American citizen his reputation or his right to a livelihood, would say, or his or her today, nor should he or she be in danger of losing his reputation or livelihood merely because he or she happens to know someone who upholds unpopular beliefs. Who of us doesn't? Otherwise, none of us could call our souls our own. Otherwise, thought control would have set in. And this is quite relevant today to some of the accusations that are being made by people who protest. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zom. Um, I'd like to uh, next welcome Professor uh, Ron Weisberger. Um, it's very difficult and, and almost dangerous to uh, talk about the most important amendments to the Constitution. Um, I think um, Professor Ron Weisberger's readings of these three uh, might categorize as the uh, top top-notch amendments. Whoops. Whoops, there it goes. I can hold it. No, I can't do it. Um, I love mics. Anyway, good afternoon to those people who are paying attention, which is people in this, people. Um, I have in my hand a very uh, subversive document. It's called the Constitution. It's actually called the Hip Pocket Guide, and you can carry it around with you. Um, sadly, uh, it's not very hip, I think, for uh, most Americans. Uh, most Americans uh, know very little about what's in the Constitution, which is what the idea of this day is. And um, in a better world, maybe, this whole place would be packed. <clears throat> but um, for those of you who are paying attention, and are here that I think it's very important to understand um, the Constitution. Having taught for many years here and some other places, I know that most of our students, or most students or people, uh, as I say, don't really understand how our Constitution operates, don't really understand how our government operates. Um, very few people, relatively very few people vote. For example, in the um, last election last Tuesday, a uh, very important election for Fall River, only 30% of the people bothered to vote. And it's great that those people came out, but that's 70% of the people who didn't vote. And uh, that's really a sad commentary when you think that we're in Iraq supposedly fighting for democracy. There's a real uh, irony here, uh, which seems to have somehow have missed uh, many of our populace. But anyway, that's the way it is. Um, and maybe something like this can make a little bit of a dent, just a little bit of a dent, right? Um, I wanted to um, read a couple of amendments, as Eric and I think other people have mentioned. Um, the Constitution itself is really a flawed document. It's a wonderful document, historic, and it's a living document, but it's flawed in the sense that uh, the founders eliminated uh, many people uh, from the lofty um, ideals that the Constitution um, reflected. <clears throat> it was mostly uh, was written for white uh, men at the time. And it took a long while uh, for other people to be brought in. Uh, the 13th Amendment was passed, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were passed after a, uh, a, tr a tremendous conflict, the Civil War, which still remains the um, 
most ferocious war that we fought was more people killed than uh, any other war. And we've had some pretty uh, tough wars since then. Uh, but as a consequence of the, of the Civil War, these amendments were passed um, in a kind of interesting situation where not everybody, not all the states participated, but the people who won the war were able to get them passed. Um, so I just want to read, just to remind you, for those who may remember and those who don't, what the uh, 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, and 15th Amendment say. Uh, the first one, Amendment 13, says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to its jurisdiction. Uh, Congress should have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So the 13th Amendment eliminated slavery. And I think you can understand the irony of a country founded on freedom with all the lofty rhetoric that we've heard from Jefferson and others, and yet slavery existed for nearly half of our history. Well, at least the 13th Amendment did eliminate it, uh, at least uh, on paper and then in reality, although it did continue to exist in certain, certain ways. The 14th Amendment um, here says, says this, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States, citizens of the United States, and of the state wherein they reside. So they're both citizens of, this, of the United States and the states. No state, it's important, shall enforce or any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunity of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the law. So this was very important because what it did is gave to the former slaves the civil rights that they certainly deserved. Sadly, uh, once the uh, southern states came into the Union again, they proceeded to take away most of those rights with a variety of laws under what we call Jim Crow. And it wasn't until 1963 that the Congress eventually passed the laws that would give them the civil rights that they deserved and should have had from the beginning. But at least it was put in the Constitution, but it took struggle for that to occur. Um, and then the last one, Amendment 15, said the rights of citizens of the United States to vote, I just said before, to vote, shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So again, slaves who, of course, were not allowed to vote, nor were women, uh, well, the sl white slaves, former slaves, were given the right to vote. Women didn't get to vote till 1921. However, again, uh, once the, uh, beginning in 1876, once the southern states were brought in, uh, they proceeded to take away that right to vote, and it was only for 100 years later, uh, nearly 100 years later, that was the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965 that the African Americans in the South got the right to vote. So again, it, it came about through struggle. So I think the, the idea here is that the, the Constitution, found, you know, created by the founders, provided the opportunity to amend what was a flawed document and bring everybody into the, uh, you know, into the country as free citizens with all the rights that they deserve. However, it's only through struggle that uh, these rights get enacted. Uh, it doesn't happen by just um, having it handed to you. And then, again, as I indicated, it's an ongoing struggle to keep those rights. And uh, so, but the idea is to understand the Constitution, to know what rights you have, and to fight for it and take advantage of it. Again, if we don't vote, uh, I know this is sort of like spitting in the wind, but if you don't vote, then those rights could easily be taken away from you. And in fact, they have been taken away. Uh, but hopefully people will continue to uh, remember what is in this document and, and enforce it. Thank you.